Okay, good morning. Let's go ahead and get started. Water. Okay. Uh, does anybody have questions about how the seminars are going to work tomorrow? Uh, no questions? Okay, you do come up and see me during the break. Uh, there's three different seminars you can actually go to tomorrow, so a total of 15 points and you make all of them. Um, all right, so we're going to start a new chapter today, and it's actually going to be um, really going into the heart of cell biology, that is how do you traffic proteins to different compartments and get them to do their correct function. So that's a big issue in cell biology. And so uh, this chapter we will deal with uh, for several different lectures. So our learning objectives are to be able to categorize where, how a protein is going to get to where it's going to go. And the first decision that needs to be made is, do you make that protein in the cytosol and then let go of it? Does the ribosome let go? So is it a ribosome unattached protein after it finishes? Or does the ribosome remain attached and then drag it to the, uh, the ER? So those are the two choices. And so we need to be able to distinguish between those. And so then we're going to uh, categorize the basic ways you can move proteins around the cell. And it has a slightly different nomenclature than what we've been using for transport. Uh, and then we'll look at how different pieces of the protein actually encode the information about its destination. Okay, and we'll get to this fourth one probably uh, a little later in the lecture. All right, so one of the first things is to um, let's go back to the outline, to the outline, and look at some of these um, proteins that are going to um, it just begins, all, all protein synthesis begins on the ribosome, but then some of these proteins are actually completely finished on the ribosome without ever touching the ER. So those are called ribosome unattached proteins. And so uh, the, the targeted areas that do that sort of thing are proteins that belong in the nucleoplasm. Think, what would be an example of a protein that goes in the nucleoplasm? We just finished talking about 15,000 poster Pardon me? Dubois Marines. Dubois Marines. Yes, absolutely. And all those thousands of transcription factors we just talked about, those are all going to be made on ribosome, start on the ribosome, finish on the ribosome, chunk into the cytoplasm. Okay. Uh, cytoplasm, uh, if, there's, if the protein belongs in the cytoplasm like a glycolytic enzyme, glycolytic glycolysis, as you know, occurs in the cytoplasm. So all those glycolytic enzymes and hexokinase, all those different ones, uh, belong in the cytoplasm. So they're going to be made and finished on a ribosome okay? um, that never touches the ER. And then for very special compartments, and here are three good examples, uh, mitochondria, chloroplasts, and peroxisome. If you want a protein to go in there and work, what you do is you make the protein completely, dump it into the cytosol, and then it carries a targeting sequence that tells it to go to those different uh, organelles and be taken up. So it's got information to be taken up. So that one's, this one's a little bit difficult because you have, to, you have to know that that organelle has its own way of getting proteins into it. Uh, and then this one's a little complicated. Um, some membrane proteins. Most membrane proteins are going to go into the ER, so you're going to start on the, rib the ribosome in the cytosol, and then it's going to attach to the ER and then put it into the, the ER lumen or into the ER membrane. That's for most of them. But there are a few cases, okay? For example, um, if you are a peripheral membrane protein, but you're a cytoplasmic peripheral membrane protein. Remember, peripheral proteins could be on the inside of the cell or outside. So if they're on the inside, then they're going to be made in the cytoplasm, and so therefore they follow this rule. They start on a ribosome, they never touch the ER, they go into the cytosol. Okay. What's a good example of a, uh, a peripheral membrane protein that we talked about that would fit this bill? Rats. Well, RAS is protein, so that's an integral membrane protein. But that's still, that's actually a good example because that's covered right here. So what, what he's saying is, so RAS is a lipid anchored membrane protein, but not all lipid anchors are on the inside, right? Some proteins are lipid anchored on the outside of the cell, such as prions, alpha phosphatase, variable glycoprotein, that thing on the trypanosome. So 
those are a little bit tricky, and so are peripheral membrane proteins. So what's a, a, a peripheral membrane protein that is on the cytoplasmic side? There's dozens and dozens of them. Think of a red blood cell. Would band three be one? Black of four? I can name them all. Okay, you think about that and then see if you can solve that. We'll go on to this, this list here. Technically, if it's a protein that's in the ER membrane or in the ER lumen, it's going to be made on a ribosome that ultimately becomes attached to the ER. Okay? If it's going into any of these organelles, those are all the ER, Golgi, lysosome, secretory vesicle, and the plasma membrane are all connected into what we call the secretory pathway. All of those membrane proteins, or in the, if they're in the lumen of this secretory vesicle or any of those organelles, they have to be finished on an ER attached ribosome. Okay, and then we still and we have the same complexity for integral or exoplasmic peripheral membrane proteins, depending on which side of the membrane they exist on. Okay, so. And then nuclear, this is another tricky one. So up here, you have to really be careful. If it's going to the nucleoplasm, it's made on a ribosome, it's dumped into the cytosol, it goes in through the nuclear core, right? But what if it's going into the nuclear envelope? That goes into the ER, okay? And so we'll look at examples of proteins that, that do that. Okay, so what we want to do now is look at a roadmap of the different ways you can get proteins to go where they're supposed to go. This is a big deal because if the protein goes to the wrong place, it what? It has no. It loses its function. Okay. So, um, in so there's three different ways, and, the, and again, the, the terminology is a little different. There's gated transport, transmembrane transport, and vesicular transport. Let's look at a cartoon of this rather than just the words. Okay, so this just shows the interior of the cell and all the different uh, possibilities that a protein must uh, decide between. And it's, it's really very packed in standing room only. So there's a lot of complexity in going from anywhere in the cell to anywhere else in the cell. Okay. Um, so here are the three choices. What your book refers to as gated transport is a protein moving through the nuclear pore. It does not cross the nuclear envelope per se, it goes through the nuclear pore. So that's called gated transport. Do not confuse that with channel gating. That's a different issue. This is a whole protein moving from the cytosol into the nucleus and back. So the proteins can go back and forth between the um, nucleus, the nucleoplasm and the cytosol, depending on what their targeting sequence is. Okay, so that's called gated. Think of the nuclear pore as a gate. And we will talk about that um, uh, right away. Okay, so the second method is to go actually across the lipid bilayer. That's complicated. You have a big pro how does a big floppy protein go across the plasma membrane? It cannot use a transporter. Actually, there are a couple that, are, that might be involved. But in general, it's too large, and so it uses this big complex thing called a protein translocator. So transmembrane, um, movement occurs between the cytosol and the ribosome and the endoplasmic reticulum. So any of those secretory pathways, if you're headed for the lysosome, for example, you've got to start by going into the, the ER. If you're going to the peroxisome, mitochondria, uh, if you're going to chloroplasts, um, what happens is you first are dumped into the cytosol and then the targeting sequence takes you to these different organelles and you're taken up because you have the license to enter. So that's a little bit complicated. But, but that's still transmembrane transport. Okay. And then the final method is vesicular transport. And that is we're going to move a protein by putting it in a vesicle and shuttling it, infusing it to a different destination. That's a little bit more complicated. So to look at that, so if you're going to use vesicular transport, you're always going to start <coughs> off in the ER. Okay. And the, the steps are here's the donor membrane. And here's the target membrane that you're going to fuse with. And so what you do, here are the cargoes. This is what we want to move 
And those cargos can be soluble in the ER lumen or they can be um, integral membrane proteins. And what you have to do is butt off a vesicle. So there's a, there's a way to butt off those vesicles into a coated um, you know, transport vesicle. And immediately you have to uncoat the vesicle so that it displays the targeting machinery. So budding and targeting are very different. So you have to coat it in order to bud it, and then once you uncoat it, then it displays a missile guidance system <coughs> that allows it to fuse with the target system. So this stuff is pretty complicated, so we'll, we'll get to that a uh, little bit later. Okay, so those are the three mechanisms, and we'll start with, well, let's just look at in general, I said earlier that the, the protein has to have a sequence that tells it where to go. It's actually embedded in the sequence, the primary sequence. Okay, so if you, we'll look at a couple of examples, but we're not going to memorize this whole list, obviously. All right, so if you want to go into the nucleus, uh, that's called a um, nuclear localization sequence. It has some, it has some uh, general characteristics. Usually there's a couple of prolines, and then there's a stretch of positively charged amino acids. So that little patch is going to tell it that it has the license to go in to the nucleus. And we'll look at that mechanism today. What if you're in the nucleus and you need to leave? Okay. So if you're, you've been, um, somehow you got in there, but you're, uh, you actually have some function outside in the cytoplasm, you need a nuclear export signal. Okay. And that has alternating leucines generally. But there's a lot of hydrophobic amino acids, but leucines tend to be the preferred uh, amino acid in that little patch. So that tells the, that the cell machinery that it can go through the nucleus in one direction, which is back into the cytoplasm. And some proteins that shuttle between, they actually have both of these. So they have that sequence and they have that sequence. That makes them pretty interesting. Uh, finally, the other one, we're going to ignore all these special ones to get into proxisome. And our poster child for a transit sequence, that is to get into an organelle, is going to be the signal peptide. And that's what this thing is here. And it has various characteristics. It's usually got uh, one or two positively charged amino acids. But this, this sequence here doesn't have it, Okay, even though the book says, well, it should have one or two uh, positively charged. This is really important. It's a stretch of at least 10 amino acids. They're all hydrophobic. That's because this is going to hang up in the lipid bilayer. Okay? And then there's a bunch of polar residues some of them fully charged, some of them uh, just polar. And this is where this is going to get cut off. Because you, you don't want to leave the signal peptide attached to the <coughs> protein because it has no function in the protein. It's just a target. It's not part of the enzymatic catalytic center. So it's just a targeting sequence. All right, so those in general are some good examples of things. And so let's look at a practical example. This is the gate of transport between the nucleus and the cytosol. All right, let's refresh our memory about um, the architecture of the nuclear envelope. And remember, the ER is the nuclear envelope. It's attached to it. Okay? But we, we give it a special name when it is attached to the nuclear lamina. And so this is the nuclear envelope. This is the outer, um, outer nuclear membrane. This is the inner. What separates those two are these nuclear pores. That actually defines which side of the membrane you're on. Okay. Otherwise, it would just be a sac. Because up here, which one of these is the inner and outer? You don't know, right? It's just the ER. But when you touch the nucleus, you then have an inner and an outer membrane. Okay. Now, on the inside, you're very familiar with the fact that there's a nuclear lamina. That's what holds everything together. In fact, the way the cell breaks up the nucleus in mitosis so that the two microtubules can get at the chromosomes is to phosphorylate this lamina and it breaks apart. And the whole nuclear envelope will fall apart. Okay, and we'll look at that very briefly. And then you have these little entranceways. These are the gates, these nuclear pores. The more active the cell, the, the greater the number of nuclear pores because there's more information coming in and out of the nucleus. So it's very, very dynamic. So let's look at the structure. Well, there's the nuclear lamina. Uh, remember, it's, it's a type of cytoskeletal filament, and it's specifically called intermediate filaments. It's not microtubules. It's not microfilaments. It's intermediate filaments. 
And this is actually holding on to the inner um, nuclear membrane with one side, and the other side it's using proteins to attach to chromatin, so it's actually holding on to DNA. And if the DNA is attached to the nuclear lamina, what kind of chromatin is it? Is it heterochromatin or euchromatin? It's heterochromatin usually. Okay, so, all right. Now, this is the nuclear pore structure, and we do not have to memorize, uh, memorize all these different components. Basically, it's composed of proteins that are called nucleoporins, which tells you it's a nice choice of words, and they tend to have uh, repeats of two amino acids, phenylalanine glycine, so it's FG repeats, FG, FG, FG. And those FG repeats are going to be used as like rungs on a monkey bar for proteins to bind to and swing through this device. Okay, so it's got eight-fold symmetry, and you can actually see that in um, um, scanning or uh, transmission electron micrographs. You could count them, there's eight-fold, um, and you can look at it from the side view, and it's got little filaments coming into the nuclear pore, and it's got little fibrils that jut out into the cytosol. And so this is a pretty accurate um, uh, figure. All right. So now let's look at where is the permeability barrier. Okay. If you are nine nanometers in diameter or smaller, you can diffuse through this little torturous place. You go right in there. Okay. And these are all these the sequences jutting out here contain the nuclear porins that this thing is reading. Okay. But it, you don't need to read it if you're small. You can just go right through there. That's about 60 kilodaltons if you want to do molecular weight versus uh, diameter. Now, the cutoff is 49 nanometers. If you're 49, uh, I'm sorry, the, yeah, if you're above 6 and up to the 49, you, you need to go through using an active transport <coughs> mechanism. So you will have to be helped across, and there are proteins that do that. Okay. So there's a size exclusion property, but big things and small things can go in. But there is no difference between the pH of the cytosol and the pH of the nucleoplasm because, for one thing, there's no uh, pumps that are changing that um, acidity, but, but pH, uh, protons can go through here all the time. They're not excluded. Okay, now, so here is, um, this just shows the importance of having the right signal to go in the right direction. So this protein is a, and we'll actually talk about it, it's a, um, uh, nuclear antigen of an activated T cell, nuclear factor. So this is a transcription factor. And it has this sequence, uh, I believe it's on the N terminus, and we would recognize that as a nuclear localization sequence, an NLS, right? Because it's got a couple of prolines, and it's got a string of positively charged amino acids. And if it has that sequence, and you, you put a fluorescent probe onto that protein, that protein is only going to be located in the nucleus because as soon as it's made, it goes right into the nucleus, right? And so what you see here is the nuclei of all those T cells. You don't even see the cytoplasm. You can't even see it. What happens, though, if you were to alter the sequence and you replace one of these lysines with the three name? It's still polar. It's just not positively charged. That destroys the lysines. This has no longer has a lysine uh, to go into the nucleus. And you can notice it stays out into the cytosol until the cytosol suddenly becomes apparent and the nucleus is dim because nobody's going in there. So this is really important. You can't mess with these sequences very much. Very conservative. Okay, and is there a sequence to leave? Absolutely, it's just slightly different. It's got leucine, skip one, leucine, skip one. So there's a, a different type of sequence. Okay, so uh, this is gated transport, and the first thing we need, let's, let's start with a protein like the uh, uh, NFAT, nuclear factor of an activated T cell. And so that's the cargo, and it must have the nuclear localization sequence. And so that's this little, it's slightly different, you know, it's, like it's, it's pretty much the same, but it's got a few differences. But it's all going to be recognized by this thing, which is a nuclear import receptor. Okay. So this thing has two little binding sites. One is for the cargo protein, and one is for something else inside the nucleus. Okay. So it holds on to it, and you can get real complicated. What if your little signal doesn't fit into the available import receptors? Well, then you can use an adapter protein. So we're not going to worry about that complexity, but just understand that it exists. Okay. But the, the hallmark is 
Um, you, in order to go in, the one thing you need is an import receptor that drives <coughs> to the cargo. Okay, the other thing you're going to need is this switch. Okay, so it looks familiar, or it should look. These are uh, small GTPase binding proteins, and we've looked at this before because um, this is how you regulate the eukaryotic initiation factor. Remember that complicated story. This one works the same way. Okay, and this, here's, the, here's the classic um, GTP switch. Um, when it's off, it's bound to GDP. Okay? When it bumps into its guanine nucleotide exchange factor, it's GIF. What it does is it causes that protein bumping into this, causes it to lose GDP and pick up GTP. Okay? So when it's in the GTP bound state, it's now on, and it changes from being a quiet protein to having a, a little signal there. Okay? And so this thing can bump into proteins and bind and tell them to do stuff, right? Just like phosphorylation works. So it's, it's like phosphorylation, except you're moving a nucleotide on and off to turn the protein on and off, or off and on, okay? And then, of course, to complete the cycle, if it bumps into this clothing store, then it causes that to, to split the GTP and eject the phosphate, returning it to the GDP bound state, which means it's off. So let's go back here, and let's see. So this, this is RAN, and it's kind of a neat name because it, it runs things in and out between the nuclear pore. Um, so what it does is the reason it knows which direction to take the protein <coughs> is because the GEFs and the GAPs are on different sides of the membrane. That causes the unidirectionality of the protein transport. All right, so the RAN GEF that's going to cause the switch to come on is located bound to the chromatin. It's actually bound in the DNA, not the DNA, but the proteins that are attached to the DNA. And so if it's, got, if it's loaded with GDP, it bumps into this thing. Well, so it's coming in from the cytosol because it's off. It comes in through the nuclear pore. It has its own little transport uh, import receptor that we're not going to talk about. But it's going to come through here, and then it hits the RAN GEF. It <coughs> loses GDP. It picks up GDP, and now it's ready to do its job, which is in the nucleus. And one of the jobs, as you'll see, is it has to take proteins out of the nucleus. And as it leaves, it encounters one of those little fibrils that jut into the cytoplasm. Those fibrils are holding on to the RAN gap. And when it bumps into this as it leaves, the gap activates the intrinsic GTPase activity. Remember, the gap is not the, the enzyme. This is an enzyme. It is a GTPase, and you can't activate it unless you bump into this guy. And so this is pushes it, changes the conformation, and it splits GD, GTP in, back into GDP and loses phosphate. And then it can be taken back into, for another cycle. Okay, so let's, let's do something useful. All right. All right, so here we have a, uh, this could be that nuclear factor of an activated T cell, NF-18. Okay. So that's the cargo. The way it gets in is it binds to its nuclear import receptor. The nuclear import receptor is then going to swing through, <coughs> using active transport, it's going to use energy, it swings through the nuclear pore because the nuclear import receptor recognizes those FG repeats on the nuclear pore. So it just grabs it and swings its way into the nucleus. The problem is, that's fine, it gets into the nucleoplasm, but the import receptor cannot discharge its cargo until it bumps into RAN GDP. Okay, so what happens is an activated RAN GDP, it fits into this other binding pocket. Remember, there's two pockets. One is for, that's why it's drawn like an S. One is for the cargo, the other is for RAN GDP. So when RAN GDP binds into this little pocket, what it does is it displaces, it actually causes a conformational change. The cargo is unloaded. NF activated T, so that, that transcription factor is now active in the nucleus and can do its job. It can bind to DNA and turn on genes, right? But this is now holding on to the import receptor. And in this form, it takes it back into the cytoplasm. Because remember, in order to take, to go out, ran um, must be in the GTP form. It cannot exit the nucleus if it's in the GD, GDP form. Okay. So it goes through here. It's active. What does it do? It bumps into one of these fibrils. It hits the, the, the RAN gap. It loses 
it, becomes, it goes back to the GDP state, and that changes the conformation so it releases the import receptor to pick up a new cargo. So this cycles over and over and over. Where does this go? Well, you know where it goes. It goes back to the nuclear core, bumps into the RAND gap, and becomes RAND GDP again. So there's two cycles going on. There's the, the cycle of the import receptor and the cycle shown in this, this previous slide of RAND that's going over and over and over. Okay, so it's a little complicated, and just if you think through this a few times, uh, you'll get used to it. Now, how do you, so that's if this is an NLS. Nuclear localization sequence, two prolines, and a bunch of positive charge. What if you have an NES? You've got leucine, skip one, leucine, skip one, leucine. That's an NES, nuclear export signal. And what happens is you've got to use a nuclear export receptor. Okay. Nuclear, so that's this little, sorry, this little brown thing. Okay. Nuclear export receptor. And so it starts off in the nucleus, okay, and it has to bind to RAN GDP first before it can pick up the cargo. RAN GDP tells it to go pick up the cargo. And it does that by changing the conformation of this little piece, that little binding pocket right there, and so that here's the cargo. It now recognizes the NES. So when this binds to this, RAN is already on there. So this is just the opposite. Remember, if you're coming in, the cargo loads first. If you're, if you're leaving, RAN GTP loads first. Okay. So it's the same trimeric complex. You've got an export receptor, you've got RAN GTP, and you've got a cargo. And it wings its way back through the nuclear port. Does it bump into that fibril again? Absolutely. It, it hits the, the RAN gap. The RAN gap shoves on it, and it causes it to split GTP. That causes it to go to the off state. It unbinds and it releases the cargo and it releases the export receptor so that it can come back in for another round. So slightly different mechanisms, but you can see that they're very they're, they're similarity between the two. But in this way, you can get things to go in and out, in and out. Okay, that's a lot to, to digest. Um, are there questions before we will do a practical example here? It's one of those learning objectives. Is, there, can we, is this so useful that we can actually design medicines that take advantage of this, this trafficking mechanism and we can actually force the cell to do things that we want it to do instead of what it actually is doing? Questions? Straightforward. Okay, so the best way is usually is just to walk through an example. Okay, so um, here's a, this is a, a T cell. Okay, it's, it's found in the, it's a type of lymphocyte. And T cells are known for attacking things. There's lots of different T cells. Um, they're, they're known for attacking cells in your body that are not your self. So these distinguish between self and non-self. So they help reject things that aren't supposed to be there. And that's when they get really activated. So in the activated state, we're not going to talk about how that, that T cell becomes activated because that's a really complicated story. Um, and, but we'll just say, all right, the cell is, is activated. What happens is this cytoplasmic calcium concentration goes up. Calcium spikes turn neurons on, and they turn, so they turn exocytosis on. We, we talked about that already, but they also turn C, uh, T cells on. So, in the high calcium state, uh, the cell becomes activated. And one thing it does is um, it activates this protein right here that's aptly named calcineurin. So it's, this is a calcium-dependent protein in the, when calcium is high. And so this is, its activity is it's a protein phosphatase. So it cuts phosphates off. And NF, so this is nuclear factor of activated T cells, NFAT, right? So in the off state, it's phosphorylated. That's one thing you have to remember. In the off state, it's phosphorylated, and it's in the cytosol. Okay. The problem is, in that state, it has a nuclear um, export signal, but no, no nuclear import signal. So that's why it's out there, is because it's displaying, that it's actually a little green ball right there <coughs> on the protein, right? It doesn't look green. It's just a, a region of the protein that has that nuclear export signal. What would it have? Leucine, 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 leucine. All right. 
So that's displayed, so it can't come back in here. Okay? But we've activated it. We want this nuclear, this, this transcription factor to come turn on genes so that this T cell can do its job and destroy a cell, right? Okay, so how does it do that? The phosphatase strips off the phosphates. That exposes the nuclear, the NLS, the nuclear localization sequence. And simultaneously, calcineurin blocks the nuclear export signal. So it's a two, you get a twofer. You block the green thing and you expose the red one. And so therefore, it's not, it's not being told to go out, it's being told to come in. Okay. And so you, you control this transcription factor by exposing or hiding the transport signals. Okay, so it's got an NLS. What is it going to bind to to go into the nucleus? <coughs> It's going to use that gated transport. So what's the first step? <coughs> it binds to the nuclear import receptor. It does. <coughs> so the first thing it binds to is the nuclear import receptor. It doesn't need to ram anything at the moment. So it binds into one of those little S-shaped things, into the cargo binding pocket. That thing flips through the monkey bars, which are the FG repeats. It goes to the nuclear porins. Aha, now it's on the inside, but it cannot release the import receptor until what happens? What's going to bind to the other binding pocket? Somebody say next, what? Yeah, the, the, the switch, the GTPA switch. In what form must it be? the GTP on state. So that binds, so you can't see that going on here, but you're, you need to imagine that this part is in one little piece of that binding pocket. The other binding pocket is going to pick up RAN GTP, and that's going to eject the cargos. The calcineurin and the, nu the nuclear transcription factor are now released to do their job, and you can't see it, but RAN GDP is now bound to the import receptor and takes it back out. Right. So that completes the cycle. And it's, as it leaves, it's carrying, it's carrying the import receptor. It bumps into one of the RAN gap, the gaps, and that causes it to split GTP back to GDP, which turns it off, and RAN G, GDP is going to come back into the nucleus to get re, reloaded with GTP. Okay, so that's all hidden in this diagram, but you need to be able to project what's going on there. So now we have the cargo that's free and can bind to DNA. It has some DNA binding motif, which you could look up. It's going to bind and do all the stuff that we talked about for the first three weeks of the class. All right, so now it's in there. It does its thing. It tells the, C, uh, the T cell to destroy the non-self cells. And if you have an autoimmune disease, it will destroy your own stuff. So there's, it's, it's relevant to that type of disease, too. So <clears throat> what tells it to go away, to stop killing things? What happens is the calcium signal decreases. It's actually the frequency of calcium pulses decreases, but that's neither here nor there. So low calcium in the T cell uh, is felt in the, the nucleus just like it is in the cytoplasm. Why? Because calcium goes through here freely diffusing. There's no membrane for it to cross. All right, so what happens is in that state, the kinase phosphorylates the NFAT. It, what does it phosphorylate? It phosphorylates the nuclear localization sequence area. So it, it masks the nuclear localization sequence, and the change in conformation causes this little display of the nuclear export signal. Okay, now, how do we get out of the nucleus? What's the first step? It's slightly different from what we just talked about, about coming in. You still need two key things that you always need but the sequence in which you need them is, is slightly different. You're, just, you're waving a flag that says, I need to go out. And there's the piece of protein. What binds first? RAN GTP. Yeah, RAN and then the GTP form. So it's always RAN, but it's, remember the state. It's the active state. That allows it to pick up the cargo. So now it, oh, so there's that flag. Okay, so now that, that export receptor is holding on to RAN GTP. It recognizes this as a, a trimeric complex. It then crawls back through uh, the nuclear pore and monkey bars. 
and then it hits one of the fibrils, which causes RAN GDP to split off a phosphate and become RAN GDP. It's off, it dissociates, the export receptor dissociates, it returns this back to the resting state. And out here, it doesn't do any harm. It's just a, it's, that's a really um, standard way of protecting yourself between de about dangerous transcription factors is stash them in the cytoplasm when you don't need them. Okay, so uh, let's take a practical medical example. So what if you're, you've given a person a new kidney and it's not a perfect match, so there's going to be activated T cells all over the place. Okay, and so what do you have to do? You need to, what, what kinds of drugs do you give them? Just in general. Autoimmune depressants. Immunosuppressants, right? And so a classic one is something called cyclosporin A, and there's also FKA506, just whatever. Cyclosporin A is an immunosuppressant. How does it work? They both work, the one I mentioned earlier, uh, work in the same way. It's a drug that comes and inactivates calcineurin. So if you inactivate calcineurin, I don't care how activated this T cell and how much calcium it is, you cannot split off the mask that's guarding the nuclear localization sequence. And that person does not attack its own, the newly transported organ. Okay, so you can play this game with the immune system in all kinds of different places um, to get the type of response that you want. Is it dangerous to be messing with this? Absolutely. There's side effects and all kinds of things, but it's better than not having a kidney. And we're getting better at it, so there's all kinds of things we can do. All right, questions? <coughs> Okay, let's take a break. Okay, uh, let's get started again. So, I did mention in passing that one of the things that has to happen uh, during prophase of mitosis is that the nuclear envelope has to fall apart. So how do you get, uh, cause that to happen? Well again, it all has to do with the nuclear uh, lamina, which is composed of intermediate filaments called lamins. And basically, because this is holding on to the membrane on one side and to the chromatin on the other, if you can disrupt this lamina, things fall apart. Okay, so what happens is you phosphorylate the nuclear lamina. And if you do it at the right uh, position, what happens is the lamina breaks, dissociates, and so that means that the membrane is going to turn into little vesicles and disperse, and the DNA is going to be released. And certain things go with each of those components. What happens is the chromatin is still bound to the RAN GEF. Okay, so that remains, uh, even during the movement of the chromosomes, it's, it remains associated with the RAN GEF. And that's important because when this reforms, you want to be able to tell the chromatin to be on one side of the membrane and for everything else to be on the other side. <coughs> Whereas the RAN GEF, or, or GAP, is just distributed in the cytoplasm, so it's all over the place. Okay, so what happens is when this thing, when it reforms in, uh, you know, an anaphase uh, or prophase, the nucleus is going to, actually, uh, the ER is going to um, coalesce around the chromatin, um, partly because that RAN uh, GTP is forming next to the chromatin itself, because what is it doing? RAN GDP is all over the place, but it's bumping <coughs> in to the RAN GEF near the, the chromatin. And so you have the, in, the export, you have the little machine, unidirectional machine, that's generating its own little nucleus. And these things keep fusing and fusing. What is the, the, the ER that dispersed? What is it holding on to? The nucleoporins, okay? So there's no place for anything to go out until the nucleoporins are reassembled uh, by virtue of the ER reattaching to um, the nuclear lamina. So what has to happen is this has to become dephosphorylated and it has to coalesce around the, the chromosomes and because the the ran gaff is, is already trapped on the inside you already have this uh, unidirectionality of where ran gaff is and where the ran gaff is. Okay. So not to go into too much detail, the, the key point is if you're going to break this um, nucleus up you need to do one thing and that's to phosphorylate the laminates. 
And if you're going to reassemble it, you'll have to cut those phosphates off. Okay. All right, so, and we'll get into to, uh, mitosis in detail uh, quite a bit later for that. All right, so protein trafficking. So um, we want to, to look at our first organelle in the secretory pathway. We're really still talking about transmembrane transport. Or we're, yeah, we're going to actually go from gated to transmembrane transport. So we need to know, understand how this thing works. And the ER has dozens and dozens and dozens of functions. And so uh, we want to get to that. So this is our first example of taking a protein and moving it across uh, a lipid bilayer. And that, that happens to be the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, you could study this by taking a protein and going to the peroxisome. But this is going to be our poster child of transmembrane protein transport. All right, so the ER is an extremely dynamic system. Um, it is, it has the, the shape it has because these tubules are attached to the underlying cytoskeleton via motor protein that are continuously stretching and creating new branches. Uh, I don't think I have that video, but there's one on your DVD, and it's about the dynamics of the ER. It's just continuously changing shape. So it is extremely dynamic and interacting with all kinds of uh, uh, proteins that give it this shape. One of the hallmarks is it's, it's uh, instead of being a big circle where um, the, the surface area to volume ratio is minimized, this has, th this is stretched into tubules which maximizes the membrane surface area versus to versus the volume. So it's a different um, surface area to volume ratio if you're in a tube versus a circle. Right? So what we're going to do with that is we can attach lots of different proteins to this ER. And it comes in two flavors. Most of you know this. Uh, the rough ER is defined by where the ribosomes are attached. And that's where those ribosomes are just chunking um, membrane proteins and luminal proteins into the ER. That's why they're there. So it's stashing proteins. That's what these guys are doing. Um, so if you have a cell like um, a, a pancreatic cell that's making lots of uh, digestive enzymes, it has to package those digestive enzymes into secretory vesicles. Where does that start? At the ER. So it's just loaded. In fact, I think I have a picture. Yeah, there you go. This cell, I think it is a, a, a pancreatic extracrine cell. And so this just dozens and dozens and dozens of um, <coughs> Um, ribosomes attached to the ER. So it's got a heavy machinery. And then this kind of bubbly looking stuff, that's where it's actually making new membranes. All plasma membranes, all membranes throughout the cell start at the ER. And where in the ER? The smooth ER, the SER. So all uh, lipid bilayer synthesis is going on here. And a lot of the, the vesicles that are uh, bledding off, carrying transport, uh, Proteins for transport are also coming off this region. All right, so there's two different flavors. They have different functions. Okay, one of the functions that the um, <coughs> ER has is in protein folding. It's actually in charge of folding proteins, and if they misfold, it's in charge of ejecting them. Okay, so it's going to try to get the protein to fold properly, but if it can't, there's actually a, a significant fraction of proteins that don't fold at all, and so they have to be destroyed. Because a misfolded protein is not going to function, correct? That's actually how you get cystic fibrosis, is the protein doesn't fold properly, and it never makes it to the plasma membrane. We talked a little bit about that. So folding is a big issue. Why do you do it in the ER? What, what makes sense about doing the folding properly right away? Well, if you, if you had folding that went on, let's say, let's say the lysosomes, that would be a terrible example, the lysosomes involved in folding. Okay? Well, you, you go through all the problems of targeting and budding and transferring the protein, and then you get to the lysosome and, oh, you finally figure out it doesn't fold properly. You've wasted a lot of energy. Why not do it right away? As soon as these proteins come in through the ER, into the lumen, they start, they're, they're met by a bunch of different proteins. Uh, one group of proteins is, this is uh, a protein called, or an enzyme called protein disulfide isomerase. It, it tells you exactly what it does. It takes a protein like this, this is an oxidizing environment, and it causes these things to form and reform. 
Okay. Why would you want to do that? Once this can form, this spontaneously will form in the the lumen of the ER, where, where the oxidizing environment. And so let's say it forms this this right here. What if these are not the two correct cysteines that need to be joined? What if we really need to take this cysteine and bind it to that one, and this one needs to kind of flop around and bind to this one? That's what PDI does. It, keep, it continually breaks them and reforms them until it forms the lowest free energy state. That's usually the most stably folded form of that protein. So a PDI is involved in folding the protein correctly. All right, so another pro protein that does this is called BIP, okay, and it's a really uncreative name. It lives in the ER lumen. Uh, it's, it's usually, it's, it should be by a B, little I, big P, binding protein. Um, it is a, a molecular chaperone, okay, and chaperone proteins, what they do is when proteins are, are coming off the ER, either in the cytoplasm or the ER lumen, these guys bind to them, and they're all in this big molecular family called the heat shock protein 70 family. That's what HSP stands for, heat shock protein. And heat shock proteins got their name because they appear in the cytoplasm when a cell is under heat stress. What happens to proteins? They start to denature if you heat them, right? And so the, if the cell becomes heated, like you have a fever or something, you release these heat shock proteins and they bind and they refold the protein if it unfolds. So they're there to protect you. But in general, they have a, a bunch, you don't have to have a fever for these guys to work. As soon as a protein is coming into the ER lumen, BIP will bind to it, and it will actually split ATP and squeeze the protein back and forth until it, it either folds properly, and then it can go down the secretory pathway, or if it's incorrectly folded, it's discarded and destroyed. And so this, this protein helps determine whether that protein lives or dies. Okay, and what does BIP usually do? It usually binds to hydrophobic patches on the protein. Because if a protein is displaying a hydrophobic patch, why is that bad? Hydrophobic patches, where are they supposed to be? In the core, right? So they should be touching each other, or they should be in a core, but they should be hidden, or they could be in a membrane. That's okay. But displayed in the nuclear, in, in the lumen to the aqueous solution is not a good place. So this patches onto it and then tries to get it refold to do away with the little patch that's showing. Okay? So it mends it, if you want to say. Uh, all right, so this is a folding machine, is really what it is. But it's actually an ATPase. It gets its ability to change conformations of proteins because it's splitting and binding ATP. All right, so that's a really uh, important way to, to uh, govern the, the function of the membrane uh, or the proteins that are coming in. Let's go down here. And go to the outline to complete this list. Lots of important things are happening, okay? So we have protein folding, and, oh, here's a, here's a good one. Um, there's a separate enzyme, it's called peptidyl uh, prolyl isomerase. And remember, what's our rule? What does a proline do to a sequence? Puts, puts a kink into it, right? Well, there's two ways that you, a protein can form, let me just draw it, um, form around a proline. There's a cis and a trans conformation. So this is in the, let's just, this is in the ER right here. And so you've got this sequence like this, and it encounters a proline, okay? And so then it, it does this, right? Well, you can take this PPI, peptidyl proline isomerase, and it'll go like this, and then it'll go like that. So this is the, the cis conformation, and this is the trans. So it actually rotates the peptide backbone around that proline so it's not so kinky and it forms the lowest free energy state. That's its role. So again, it's a folding protein. Okay. All right. Now, here's an important one. How do you get multimeric proteins to associate into the final complex? That actually has to happen in the ER. You can't have, so the, uh, as you know, the sodium pump has alpha, it has two alphas and two beta subunits, 
it forms a heterotetramer. Those have to actually stick together while it's in the ER. If it doesn't, it doesn't get transported. It doesn't go to the cell surface and it's ejected and destroyed. So assembly of multimeric proteins occurs in the ER. And again, this makes a lot of sense. If you can't put all the parts together, let's say a part's missing, why should you even make the rest of the protein? So that's why you control that here. And then the final thing is that quality control um, is one of the main functions of the, of the uh, ER. Um, there's lots of poaching folding diseases. I already mentioned cystic fibrosis. Another really good example is this protein here, alpha-1 antitrypsin. Um, so your, your um, pulmonary airway produces lots of mucus, obviously. And if there's too much mucus, what, what happens is that would clog up your airway. And so it produces a, a protease called trypsin that chews up those glycoproteins and keeps those uh, easy, makes it easy for those to be swept away. And that's why you need the fluid transport to sweep, sweep that stuff out of the airways. Uh, but what happens is you need this thing to be secreted along with it so that that trypsin doesn't chew up the airway itself. If you, don't, if you just let the, the trypsin chew away and you don't control it, you'll get emphysema. And that's what's wrong with, with people that have this inherited form of emphysema. They make this antitrypsin but it doesn't fold properly, and it's destroyed. So trypsin in the lung is unopposed, and the person destroys their own lung tissue. Okay. So again, it's a protein folding problem. Um, we'll come back to this quality control in a little bit, because this is sort of a major story. And the other question you should be asking, how does it, where does it destroy the proteins? How does it get it out of the ER? That's a different question. Okay. Um, so. Let's talk about the, the smooth ER specifically. I've already mentioned to you that it, this is where all the uh, phospholipids are made. We'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, this is also where all steroids are made. Steroids are actually, it's a shared function between the e, smooth ER and the mitochondria. They keep passing the steroid nucleus back and forth until they turn it into testosterone, estrogen, glucocorticoids, or whatnot. And it only occurs in certain tissues. But if you look at an electron micrograph of um, a, a cell that makes steroids, it'll have little tiny circles instead of these long looking things that I showed you for that pancreatic exocrine cells. You won't have a lot of rough ER, but you have tons and tons and tons of tubular looking um, uh, smooth ER. And actually, the, 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 because the mitochondria participate in this process, what really looks weird is, you know, the, the traditional form of the infoldings of the intermitochondrial membrane? You kind of you have those little infoldings. What are they called? Christy, right? They have tubular Christy, so they're little circles instead of these flat sacs. So uh, the, the cell looks very different for a cell that's making steroids. And one of the big components that does that is the smooth ER. Okay. Um, your ER is a really important center for detoxification. So if you encounter some xenobiotic, that is something uh, that MDR1 would love to transport, and let's say it makes it past MDR1 and hits your cell, you still have another weapon, and that's the smooth ER. It's got lots of single pass enzymes that are called oxygenases, and they all in this family called cytochrome P450. And I'll show you why that they're, they're, they are single-pass membrane proteins that are in a very particular uh, <laughs> orientation in the membrane. Uh, but what they do is they add oxygen atoms in various combinations, hydroxyls, ketones, all kinds of things, that when they do that, it makes the drug that was hydrophobic hydrophilic. And then you can excrete it because it's, it's, it's soluble in water. That way it doesn't stay stuck in your membranes and do damage to whatever um, tissue it's, it's been concentrated in. So detoxification, really big, important thing. Um, and then where's the, one of the big detoxification centers in your body? What organ does that that you know of? Liver. It's tons and tons of smooth ER. Okay. Um, this is a really important one. Uh, there's very few cells that are designed to release glucose. Most cell types take up glucose because that's their energy source. But liver, in, in these three tissues, liver, intestine, kidney, they're there to make 
glucose when you're not eating, and so they have to have the machinery to release it. Well, get, getting rid of it is not a big problem. They all have glutes, right? But the way you get it from, so if you, if you break down glycogen, it's going to be in the form of, it's going to go glucose 1-phosphate to glucose 6-phosphate. You have to take that phosphate off in order to eject it through the glute. Because remember, a glute transporter will not transport glucose 1 anything. It transports glucose and glucose only. Okay, so somehow you've got to be able to, to split that off, and you need this enzyme, glucose 6-phosphatase, and that's located in the ER. And let's, let me draw a picture, because it's, even though it sounds simple, it's not ter terrifically simple, okay? Okay, so you're, you're in a liver cell, and we're at, so this is the liver, and you have, uh, say, it's probably, in the liver, there's actually glute too. Um, so you want to get glucose and then shoot it out of the cell, right? Okay. So here's the ER, that. And what you have is you actually have an antiport that's going to take in glucose 6-phosphate and pull it into the ER. The glucose 6-phosphate comes in. Now, if this is an antiport, you have to eject something, and that something is phosphate. So you're, you're going to eject phosphate, and you're going to pull in the substrate. And the sub, the, what's going to actually take care of that is this enzyme. This is going to go through here. And so what this is, this is, um, keep it the same color, this is glucose 6 Phosphatase. I'll just abbreviate it, PAs. So this thing, this is the the uh, phosphatase that's going to clip off that phosphate. Okay. And when it does that, so this is going to come in like that. The phosphate will go there. That's just been clipped off, and that will release the glucose. Right. So you you've done the job now. You've got, but you got you're in the wrong compartment. So you've got to be able to get glucose back up to the cell so it can diffuse out. So you've got to have a transporter that kicks it out of the ER. And that is done by a new member of the family, glut 7 So this ejects the glucose back into the cytosol, and then it builds up, and then it goes down its concentration gradient through GLUT2 into the blood, and that's exactly what's happening to all of you because you're not eating. Okay. But this is only in very specific tissues. All right. Questions about that particular process? Okay. So we're actually, we did learn those for a reason, so we're starting to put these systems together. <clears throat> All right. Everybody finished with that? Okay. Right. And this one, we don't have to learn anything new because you already know about it. That is circa. Smooth <coughs> into plastic reticulum, <coughs> calcium ATDH. So as you know, uh, one of the functions of the ER is calcium storage. So the concentration of calcium is high in the lumen, and that also means it's going to be fairly high in the Golgi and secretory vesicles and the lysosome because that it starts out being high and it stays high, right? Okay, so that's a calcium storage, and that's all because of circa is in that membrane. Here's the the I mentioned to the, this earlier that. Um, the ER, the smooth ER, is the site of all lipid synthesis. So this is hugely important. Um, we have a couple of problems, though, with that. And let's get out of this. I think we're actually into this one. Yes, here we go. OK, so um, we don't need to learn the details of fossil lipid synthesis. Just understand that it's not only the smooth ER that makes this, it's one leaflet. It's the cytoplasmic leaflet 
for all fossil lipids that are made. Um, and so there's a, a technique for de delivering fatty acids, and then you, you create the head group, and eventually you make all the fossil lipids, but that's a problem, isn't it? Because they're all going into one leaflet. So what's going to happen to the ER? It's going to curve, right? Because it's got more fossil lipids in the cytoplasmic <coughs> leaflet than it does on the uh, luminal, the exoplasmic leaflet. But we saw that because there's a protein called scrambolase, and it sits in the ER membrane, and it just randomly grabs the fossil lipids and takes it and puts it in here. And then takes another one and puts it over there. And so it equilibrates the number of fossil lipids between the <laughs> cytoplasmic leaflet and the uh, exoplasmic leaflet. So that's called scrambolase. It's located in the ER. All right. But you should it, remember when we're talking about <clears throat> membrane composition and that background material uh, that you should have looked at, uh, there are specific fossil lipids that are more concentrated, concentrated in the exoplasmic leaflet than the, the cytoplasmic leaflet. What's a good example of, a, of, of one that we talk about? Fossil of this is a phosphatidyl um, phosphoglyceride that's more concentrated in cells that aren't dead in the cytoplasm. Okay, it's, it's in the cytoplasmic leaflet, and it's actually displayed on the cell surface when it wants somebody to come along and kill it. Serine, yeah, phosphatidyl serine, right? And so how do you make one of them go, and so you have the scramblaze, it's putting them in both membranes, right? But what's, it, there must be an enzyme that moves particular uh, fossil lipids to the correct leaflet. And that one's called flipase, curiously enough. So flipase is different from a scramblase because it's very specific for specific fossil lipids. Uh, a good example of a fossil lipid or a membrane lipid that is on the exoplasmic leaflet would be what? What's our rule that something in the exoplasmic leaflet, there's a couple things that might happen. We're talking about the lipids. Yeah, glycolipids. So all the glycolipids need to be flipped to the exoplasmic leaflet, and so the flipase does that, a different type of flipase. Okay, so there's specific and non-specific movement of these phospholipids, because remember, why do you need those proteins? What's the reason that, that why don't you, what, just, why doesn't this just randomly happen? Pardon me? Would have to go through the plane, the, the lipid bilayer, and that's energetically um, unfe un unfavorable. So it does not happen. Okay, and then there's the different things. Okay, so um, let's make sure that finishes. There is one other little protein in it. What if you want to take a fossil lipid and move it to a completely different organelle? Okay. That's, that's handled by this group of proteins called phospholipid exchange proteins. So you can actually grab one and take it from the ER and distribute it to the plasma membrane without having to go through the secretory um, pathway. But the main way of moving phospholipids in mass <coughs> is by vesicle trafficking. That's where you take them in bulk. So you don't do all this single stuff. You make a vesicle and you move the vesicle and you get two things for that. You're, move, you're changing the concentration of phospholipids, and you're carrying the cargo. So that's a really neat way to take care of two different problems. OK. I think that is that. And we're going to just get started on this. We have to kind of push on because we've missed a whole day um, due to that overwhelming snow that we had. Okay, now, let's do the, this is the, the really big issue, and this is how do you translate a huge protein across the plasma membrane, okay? Uh, most of the proteins go in co-translation, co-translation. What does that mean? So you've got, you got a protein that <laughs> needs to be in the membrane or it needs to be in the ER lumen, and 
So it's going to be attached to the ER at some point. Here we go. So here are the two choices. So this is code translational uh, translocation. What that means is the here's the messenger RNA and the, uh, the um, ribosome is reading it in this direction. So it's moving along this way. And so the this is the <coughs> large ribosomal subunit that has this protein channel through which the protein is extruded. And so what happens is when this gets to be about 70 amino acids long, it's going to be, it's going to eject, this is going to be about uh, 40, and this is going to be, this little uh, length of that chamber is about 30. So 70 amino acids long, it's going to poke out of the ER, or out of the ribosome. And when it does that, there's going to be a protein called the SRP, the signal recognition particle, that's going to bind to this and drag the ribosome with the messenger RNA still attached and stick it on the ER. Okay, so that this is actually still making the protein while it's going to be extruded into the ER. That's why the word is it's co-translational. Now, can you do the other opposite post-translation? Absolutely, but this is very uncommon for proteins that are going to go into the ER. In what case would this be very common if it was going to be made into a protein and go to a different organelle? In fact, it would have to happen that way. Okay, I would look that up. It's not a big point. But it's, all right, so what we're going to do is, here's this, this machine. We've got a, some kind of uh, signal that's got to project out that tells us to go into um, the ER and attach to it. Okay, and let's look at the, this little video. <laughs> and give it get an overview, and then we'll we'll talk about it. So. And let's hope this thing works. May not. The endoplasmic hey. or ER, is the most extensive membrane system in eukaryotic cells. Proteins transported to the Golgi apparatus, endosomes, lysosomes, and the cell surface all must first enter the ER from the cytosol. As an mRNA molecule is translated into a protein, many ribosomes bind to it, forming a polyribosome. There are two separate populations of polyribosomes in the cytosol that share the same pool of ribosomal subunits. Free ribosomes are unattached to any membrane. Membrane-bound ribosomes become riveted to the ER membrane and translate proteins that are translocated into the ER. These membrane-bound ribosomes coat the surface of the ER creating regions called rough endoplasmic reticula. Two kinds of proteins are moved from the cytosol to the ER. Water-soluble proteins completely cross the ER membrane and are released into the lumen, while transmembrane proteins only partially cross the ER and become embedded in the membrane. All these proteins are directed to the ER by a signal sequence of small hydrophobic amino acids. The signal sequence is guided to the ER membrane with a signal recognition particle, or SRP, which binds the ER signal sequence in the new protein as it emerges from the ribosome. Protein synthesis then slows down until the SRP ribosome complex binds to an SRP receptor in the ER membrane. The SRP is then released, passing the ribosome to a protein translocation channel in the ER membrane. Thus, the SRP and SRP receptor function as molecular matchmakers, connecting ribosomes that are synthesizing proteins containing ER signal sequences to available <coughs> ER translocation channels. In addition to directing proteins to the ER, the signal sequence functions to open the translocation channel. The signal peptide remains bound to the channel, while the rest of the protein chain is threaded through the membrane as a large loop. Once the protein has passed through the membrane, it is released into the ER lumen, after the signal sequence has been cleaved off by a signal peptidase located on the luminal side of the ER membrane. The signal peptide is then released from the translocation channel into the membrane and rapidly degraded. It is thought that a protein serving as a plug then binds from the ER lumen to close the inactive channel. But not all proteins that enter the ER are released into the ER lumen. Some remain embedded in the ER membrane as transmembrane proteins. For clarity's sake, the membrane-bound ribosome will be omitted 
to illustrate the translocation of transmembrane proteins into the ER membrane. Okay, we're going to stop that there because uh, we're going to get into that. In, we have to cover this stuff in a little bit more detail uh, before we get there. Um, except since the sound system is working, I want to show you, I think we're all too burned out to do too much further on this, so what we're going to do is try to do that video that I was going to show you. This is very important.